hanum ini gue i final of onnya i hanum when i was a little girl as young as 5 years old My mom took me to all of our family's protests to fight for the return of our land called Retidian. And today it's proposed to be used as a buffer zone for a US Marine live fire training range complex. It's being built above our island's primary water source that provides our community with 80 to 90% of our drinking water. So a buffer zone is an area that catches the stray bullets that ricochet off the berm. at the firing range. If you look on that cliff side, on top of that cliff, that's where firing range complex will be located. Uh or is proposed to be located. We're still trying to fight it. Still trying to put a stop to it. So yeah, the stray bullets from this firing range will drop into this area and into the ocean. Uh yeah, I just wanted to show you that. and then we're going to go in to see some family. Our family is one of many families across Guam whose ancestral lands were taken from them after World War II. Around 2/3 of the island was actually seized by the US after the war. Families lived peacefully at Retidian for many years before it was condemned in the 60s for national defense purposes. And then in the 90s When the land was no longer needed, it was declared excess. It was supposed to be returned back to the original landowners, my family, and three other families. But instead, it was transferred to the federal government to become a fish and wildlife refuge. So in the 90s, lineal descendants of Latexan were told that the endangered species were more important than the land being returned, and now we're being told a firing range complex is more important than protecting the endangered species because it's being built over a conservation area. It's not just the fishermen that are going to lose some of the best pristine waters around the entire island. It's not just our local healers who won't be able to access rare medicinal plants that can be found in this area. It's not just the 15 endangered species that call this place home. The turtles that nest here on the sands that come back every year that are going to be impacted at the center of this issue. There's an indigenous land rights issue. The Chamorro people were a peaceful people. We don't want our lands. We don't want our waters to be transformed into the largest military training area in the world. We just want to live peacefully on our islands. We want to be able to keep our water clean. We want to be able to preserve our freshwater aquifer for future generations. We want to protect our coastal waters from contamination, from lead dust and other heavy metals that will fall into the water that will contaminate the sand. Guam's political status as an unincorporated territory of the US is really at the heart of why the Chamorro people don't have a seat at the table to protect our resources in the midst of this mass military expansion. So we're here at the Guam Museum. This is the location of the offices of the Commission on Decolonization. And what this organization does is they look at the different political status options for Guam, independence, free association and statehood. And they understand the complex situation that we're in in regards to our political status as an unincorporated territory of the US. So, we're going to speak today with the director, Melvin Wampat Borja, just excited to pick his brain to understand the ways that our political status impacts us as a colonized people. Jesus Masi for meeting with us today. So first off, can you explain Guam's current political status and our relationship with the United States? We are domestically a part of the United States, right? We 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 operate within the system of government, but we are not privy to negotiations with other government entities with other government bodies, right? So the military build up here on Guam essentially was a bilateral agreement between the US federal government and the Japanese government. And Guam, even though we are ultimately going to bear the burden of the build up, 
we were not a part of any conversation, negotiation around how this buildup was going to happen. You know, anybody who knows the history of the buildup is basically that the United or the Japanese government, which also colonized Okinawa, let's not forget, right, that Okinawa is not Japan, that those people are not Japanese, that they also, you know, have been dealing with a long legacy of colonial rule. That, you know, the, the, after the war, the United States and Japan became allies. Part of that deal was that the United States would be allowed to have, you know, military presence in Japan. But Japan decided that they're not going to build this base in Japan. They're going to build it in Okinawa. And so, of course, you know, the, the base has a long history. The U.S. Marines have a long history of conflict with the local population. And so what we saw was that, you know, it became so problematic that Okinawans were just up in arms and very unified. You know, I mean, they marched 90,000 people in the street to close Futenma Air Base. Um, and so, of course, you know, the Japanese government had to respond. And that was how it all began, right? They, they, they then began conversation, negotiation with the United States on relocating the base. Now, what's crazy about it is that the, the Japanese government is footing a large part of the bill to not just remove the base from Okinawa, but to relocate that base here. A lot of people don't realize this, but in the draft environmental impact study for the buildup, you know, they, they clearly say that there are other alternative locations for the, the buildup. You know, they were planning, they had planned to work with either Hawaii, the Philippines, uh, or California to include Guam. But when they assessed those other three locations, those were all answered with a no. And the, the no comes from the leadership. I, mean, I think that's the important part of it, right? Is that for California and Hawaii as states, you know, they have the right to say, no, we don't want this. You know, we have Kaneohe Marine Corps base in Hawaii. We have Camp Pendleton in California. We don't want another base. We're good. And then you have the Philippines. It's a sovereign nation that said, yeah, you know, we'll, we'll pass on that too because, you know, we're, we're not going to do Subic Bay all over again. That table on the buildup where the, the conversation happened around the terms, that was negotiated between two parties with Guam as an afterthought. They even said in their DEIS that because the Philippines, California, and Hawaii all were no-go, that Guam was the ideal location. And it was because, and they say it pretty bluntly, like painfully bluntly, that they, they think Guam is the ideal location because Guam is what they consider sovereign U.S. soil. And we're a territory. And because we don't have the same level of autonomy over our affairs as a state, they can basically do whatever they want here with little to no interference from the local government. And that's exactly what they got. Senator Sabina Perez with the 36th Guam legislature shared similar sentiments about the U.S. and Japan's lack of consultation with Guam about their military built-up plans. The plan to trans transfer the Marines from Okinawa to Guam was made without Guam being at the table. The militarization of Guam, I think, is the um, predominant driving force in how development is occurring on our island. So a lot of the federal laws, U.S. environmental federal laws, have to be followed. But the problem is, in its implementation, it involves the interaction between federal agencies, which develop the regulations without the consent of the indigenous people. Yeah, the military definitely has dismissed a lot of the concerns. And it, you'll see our, our cultural sites being erased before our eyes. You'll see our forests being raised. Concerned about Guam's water resources, Senator Perez recently introduced legislation to recognize the sacred relationship between the Chamorro people and our water. Resolution 55-36 highlights the very real threat of contamination to our primary aquifer from 6.7 million lead bullets proposed to be shot at the Department of Defense's live fire training range complex. Yes, so 55-36 um, was created um, mainly because um, my, my concern about the, the live fire training range. Um, it's a. Uh, it was meant to um, to reaffirm our 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 rights to to clean drinking water, 
uh, and then how this range would it be impact would impact our drinking water um, as well as our resources, our coastal water resources. This is a time where, you know, I I did not want to accept the fact that this fire range, um, you know, there's still what a fifth fire range that is that was not constructed or is still in the process of being constructed. And it was so important for me to protect this area uh, because it houses very uh, unique uh, native flora and fauna. And one of them is a habitat to a critically endangered species called the Cerianthes nelsonii, which is the Hudson Lagu tree. There's only one reproductive tree uh, on island. And this fifth fire range would be 100 feet away from that mother tree, which has lasted, um, with, which has withstood typhoons such as Karen, you know, Typhoon uh, Pamela, which were super typhoons. In addition, it withstood World War II. This tree has been standing, um, you know, before World War II. And so imagine now we're putting a firing range uh, 100 feet from this tree that withstood all of that um, and where they're going to shoot 6.7 million bullets uh, yearly in perpetuity. And so, um, and this forest is critical because it protects this tree. It's a, it's a habitat for this tree in addition to other critically endangered species such as the Mariana eight spot butterfly. Um, and so to me, it's it's a cultural symbol. Um, and it's it's really unfortunate that the Endangered Species Act, which protected the national symbol of the US, the bald eagle, uh, from becoming extinct. Here it is, it's, it's being used to jeopardize a cultural symbol for our island. And I, to me, that's, um, yeah, it, it's egregious. Um, and um, it's important that we protect this forest. Manny Duane is president of the Guam Fishermen's Cooperative Association, who represents more than 100 fishermen with boats, has consistently spoken out against the firing range complex over the years because of impacts to water quality. You're going to have a firing range on top of a water lens, and you got a, 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 a cave down there with fresh water pool underneath. You guys didn't know that. You, you have a, a containment area pre-war, I think. That's when it was built. Oh, under the fire. You have oh, over 10 nesting turtles on uh, Hinapsan. And they're concerned about the turtles. You dumb tomorrows don't eat turtles because we need to protect it. But they're going to do 50 caliber machine guns above their nesting area. And they're going to shoot out, you know, you know one, one famous guy in Guam told me, hey, Manny, calm down, because they're shooting at targets with the 50 caliber machine gun. Shooting at target. Uh, the last time I remember a target when I was in the Army, we were shooting at cardboard. And a 50 caliber machine gun goes anywhere from four to six miles in distance. It can cut a, one bullet can cut a coconut tree in half. Every minute that 50 caliber machine gun fires, it puts 40 pounds. Uh, you know, I appreciate all the million pounds conversion. 40 pounds of projectile in the water, in the most pristine water in the world. You know, our island is blessed. We're on a pinnacle. We're not in Florida with the Florida Keys. People get confused. We don't live on a lake. Our mountain top recruits fish, leaves, they leave. They get tired of us. People ask me, oh, man, you really hate typhoons? I love typhoons because it's like flushing the toilet. It flushes our reef, cleans it back up because we screw up with the land-based pollution. And uh, there's no real concern for water quality. Uh, there's no real concern for noise pollution. Regarding the amount of bullets and spent material, but no, but to me it's just a we we cross the T's and we dotted the I's. There's no real concern for water quality. Uh, our fish move around, and that's been that's a fact. Our our fish don't stay in one location. So therefore, now what they consume, what they digest, can be passed on. You have water quality down at uh, Cocos Island that has not been remedied. I'm sure you're gonna, you have water quality at Anderson. 
has not been remedied. You have water quality issues that are going to arise from Retidian firing range. 900 football fields of land have been cleared for military build-up projects, and activists are concerned about the ways this will affect both the aquifer's ability to recharge as well as adversely affect coastal waters. I spoke with Joni Kerr, an activist, environmentalist, and science instructor who shared her thoughts on the mass clearings. And if we get rid of those forests, it's possible that um, what we're doing is we're also getting rid of a way that water um, has been entering and recharging the aquifer for thousands of years. So inside the substrate, we have these um, crevices, holes, spaces, pathways uh, for the water to move downward. And in search of that water, we have the trees following with the roots. And so we have this very complex root system that enables a pathway for water to get uh, down to the aquifer more easily. And so um, if we re remove those forests, uh, such as the pristine limestone forest across the road, uh, we remove that ability for the aquifer to be recharged. Anywhere we remove forests, we remove that ability for the, for the aquifer to be recharged. And then if we couple that with, with paving, putting up buildings, such as what's going to happen with the base and with the firing range, that actually leaves a surface, an impermeable surface. And so what's going to happen is rain falls, it pools or collects on that impermeable surface, or it's drained into um, a sewer or um, culvert system that eventually makes its way into the ocean. And so my concern is that there's not going to be as much recharging of the aquifer uh, with uh, removal of the forest, and, that, and also that we might have um, contaminants making their way into the local marine environment either through um, further uh, uh, heavy metal transportation via rain or wind, uh, eventually getting into the limestone substrate um, and then making its way out into the ocean because we are, our aquifer is connected to the ocean. That's why we have these freshwater streams, the bobos that come, that leach out into the ocean. So, so there's that potential to not just to harm our aquifer, but also to harm the local marine environment with, with toxic heavy metals. I sat down with 2022 Nobel Peace Prize nominee Hope Christobel, who for more than 35 years has organized across Guam's NGOs, local government boards, and commissions, working to protect Guam's resources and promote the Choro people's inalienable right to self-determination. Cristobal has studied the effects of military contamination in Guam's lands and waters for decades. But I haven't seen or heard of anything in 20 years where the people of Guam are asked to participate in a discussion of our, our state of being on our homeland. Nothing that addresses colonialism, nothing that addresses our inability to thrive in this environment that for 4,000 years sustained our ancestors and, and our parents. Nothing that addresses that. Nothing that addresses a way forward for a people to attain their highest purpose in life. It is so cruel. As, as a colonial people, you know, the United States has never really acknowledged the fact that we are a colonial people. They use other words to make us feel good, like we are a, nah, a territory. Excuse me? How could we be a territory? You know, the, the meaning of the word territory gives this sense of belonging. If we truly belong, then why do they not care about the environment that has sustained us for 4,000 years? You know, why do they not care for human lives? 
why do they not care for how we are living today? You know, and all you have to do, Maria, is look at the descriptors of a subjugated people. You know, subjugated people have the highest incarceration rates. That means we make the most mistakes in our own home. If home is a place you go to feel good, the home that we, we are right here in our home, obviously we are not feeling good because we are making the most mistakes in our own home. Yet other people are coming and enjoying our, an environment, you know, for tourism or the military's out here for how many, you know, three years? Because now they've, they've extended their, you know, their uh, tenure, their station. Uh, they're here for a short time, but even them, they should be just as concerned. Guam has all five branches of the military represented here. And our basis, Tijan, was NAS. You have what we call Anderson Air Force Base. Now you have another base. You know, they're not really telling us that it's a base, but it's a new marine base that they're building. When they start talking about cantonment, when they start talking about all these ancillary parts of a base, well, they're building a base, but they never, they always told us that it was for live fire range at the outset. They basically lied to us what the purpose is for clearing 12, over 1,200 acres of forest there. It's just, you know, you have this big military industry. It's just the only industry on this island. The only industry that Guam has is the military industry. And the military is famous for contaminating the grounds, the air, for contaminating the food that we grow, the soil by which we plant in. You know, we shouldn't be wondering why cancer is our second highest killer on this island. We know it has to have come from this industry. In looking at the aquifer today, we know that most of the developments occurring up north, we know there's at least 122 municipal wells, and some of those are monitoring wells. The uh, Northern Guam Lens Aquifer is the sole aquifer for this island. But in the northern part of the island, from Adelup all the way to Pago, and all the way up to uh, Litekjen and uh, you know, the northern parts of our island, you find uh, the aquifer that is not that deep down in there because the soil which filters the any, any water intrusion into the, the ground is so thin that the water that we end up with has to be kept clean. We have to prevent any other uh, Thing filtering into the water lens. Recently, I was able to attend an educational boat cruise to the Rotidian coastline hosted by local organization Protect Guam Water. And then I was informed about the dangers of the Fine Range Complex, um, how it would have hurt um, our people, not only the visitors, but also the military fam military and then their families. So today we are having a educational boat cruise. Um, we're gonna go down north and then we're gonna see the firing range complex. Our main uh, lead with the, tox the toxins from the bullets is lead. Lead in larger uh, portions can kill people. Honestly, I just want my family, uh, the other people's family, um, even if I have kids, my future generations, just to be safe. Have drink, clean drinking water, um, water to cook with, water to bathe in, water to brush your teeth in, really. And since we use 85, 85 percent of our island uses this water, it would not be such a small thing to get rid of. I feel like hiding the fact that the poison from the bullets that would be left behind, which they state that they will clean up, which is 
a funny, a funny statement, really. I just want everyone to be impacted from it and then impact others. And with that impact, I just want all of us to collectively come together and just pause, hopefully stop the buildup in its entirety. I'll be damned if we're the generation that goes, oh, sorry, Nan, we didn't work hard enough when we were alive to ensure that you also got this. Oh, sorry, Nan, we can't drink the water anymore because my generation didn't honor that obligation to each other enough. So if you have the privilege to see something as beautiful as this, to be in community with other people who also care about the land and the ocean and what it means to be part of a community, right? As islanders or as hosts or as guests on this island, being not like with an individualistic mindset, but coming here and seeing, wow, I'm part of something bigger than myself, that is our hope, right? That when you leave here, you'll say, wow, I'm so blessed to have grown up on or, or to have to have lived in somewhere with something this beautiful, even with all of the risks, even with all of the generational trauma that we carry as islanders. I hope that when you learn about the risks, and I hope that when you see us protesting or you have when you when we eventually pass petitions around and we say, hey, can you sign this petition? Can you share it with your friends? Can you make sure everyone in your WhatsApp group chat signs this petition? Okay, I hope you don't see it as like annoying, but I hope that you see it as like an honor and a privilege to fight for what we have. Right? What does Waha mean? What does Waha mean in Chihuahua? We have, okay? We have. We come from a culture of abundance, not scarcity. And so we don't want to pass off scarcity to the next generation. Right? Be Be These chemicals can travel via surface or groundwater and contaminate groundwater along with coastal and marine resources. Jim Keeney, former director of Environmental Science Associates, referencing the 2012 US EPA study, says this. There is a wide range of chemicals that are left in the soil, many of which can be mobilized by rain and travel to groundwater. Mobilized by rain and travel to groundwater. Studies like the US EPA paper call into question the Navy's supposed conclusion that there will be no significant direct or indirect impacts to our aquifer. We cannot afford as a people to move on without more data. The facts are clear. The risk is imminent. It is not to be debated. The facts are there. So what then is the cost that we're debating today what is the cost then of 170,000 lives? What is the cost of 4,000 years of history? Because we are not strangers to climate refugees here in Micronesia. We are not so far removed from the horrors of a post-World War II, post-atomic region to know what it's like for islands around us to become uninhabitable due to military activities. So what is the cost? And are you as our leaders or are us people prepared to bear the weight of it? One way the military says it will mitigate harm to the aquifer is by installing monitoring wells within the firing range complex. The monitoring wells being placed, um, I think that's an essential part of, of, of uh, ensuring that there's no contaminants coming out. But at the same time, um, we're not, um, we're dealing with, dealing with it after the fact and we, make, we need to ensure that it's, we need to prevent it from happening, first of all. The other issue that I'm seeing is that uh, a lot of this monitoring is done by federal contractors, so we don't necessarily have access to the information in a real-time basis. And um, that's one of the issues I'm seeing between the local and the federal side, um, is does the public really know what's going on until it's much later? You know, as you know, Guam has been the site of a lot of uh, toxic uh, legacy contaminants. Um, and we're only finding out now, um, if at all, um, that they're there and that perhaps they were um, impacting our health. And so with this monitoring wells, you know, where is this information going to be? Is it going to be provided to the public on, on a, um, in a regular basis? And then that's one of the issues is how transparent can the military be with our community? Um, in regards to this, uh, considering cancer is uh, one of the leading causes of death on our island, 
you know, many of these contaminants are carcinogenic. In your role here, in your role as an activist for you know decades, what are some of your biggest concerns about the potential for harm to our water resources from the military building? I think that the not just the U.S. military, but all military in general. Uh, the, all, all military operations have in some way, shape, or form had an adverse impact on the environment that they do their business in. Um, for Guam, it's, you know, being a... For Guam being a ward of the federal government, for lack of a better term, you know, we we just don't we don't have the teeth necessary in order to protect our resources and none of our resources. You know, we've asserted that we have what we have identified as our EEZ, our exclusive economic zone, not recognized by the United States. You know, there's a lot of things that happen around our waters, around our borders that we have zero control over. Um, but the to me the the reason why water is needs to be front and center is that, you know, water is a universal need for all people. It doesn't matter whether you come from a first world, third world, fifth world country, we all deserve clean water. Basic human right. What about self-determination? Isn't that also a basic inalienable human right? An inherent human right? An inalienable human right? You know, isn't that also something that we shouldn't have taken from us? Fanu hu utan zaunagi meni tano na fan hu zung si ha bobo na fan hu zung si ha saduk zan matan hano.